This conference will now be recorded. All right. <clears throat> and uh, we'll go ahead and get it started. Uh, once again, for the recording, uh, the message that we're going to be going into, we're going to be looking at um, adorning yourself with a righteous mind and what that actually looks like. And so what we're actually going to be doing is I want to look beyond the Passover, because we already know what the Passover entails, but I want us to see where the Most High is taking us from there. And we always have to see these things in a spiritual sense. We know that they happen physically, um, but we got to understand what he is doing with the remnant of Israel in a spiritual sense. And so we're going to take a look at um, the preparation for the wedding uh, and where he took us, because we know that the blood that we put on our doorposts Right, the blood that we put on the doorpost, the lamb that was slain, we know that those both of those things represent Hamashiach. Matter of fact, the uh, uh, the death angel that ran also represents Hamashiach. Right, we know that all those things represent our Messiah, and that was our deliverance. And then we know that even before our deliverance, we saw Yah's hand move, we saw his hand, we saw the might of his hand that he showed to Pharaoh, uh, in the, in the rest of Egypt. Um, when he, when he, you know, continued to, to smite them with those plagues, ultimately leading to us being um, set free. And so when we look at that blood, that blood is very important. The lamb is very important. The death angel is very important. All the instruction that was given for the Passover is very important. But when we leave or when we left Egypt, um, I want us to take a closer look at that because that is where everything went wrong immediately and it's because we did not understand what yah was trying to do with us and he's trying to do the same thing now and so we have to prepare our hearts and our minds to walk uh in perfection according to the most high's word uh so that um because that perfection or walking in that perfection is Adorning. That is the process of getting yourself ready. That is the process of putting on the new garment, putting on the jewels um, and the ornaments and things like that in order to be presented uh, as a, a righteous bride. And so we're going to take a look at that because Israel did not understand that. And so because they didn't understand that, they went and played the harlot immediately. Right. So uh, without getting too, too far ahead of myself we'll take a look at that see what it is that that uh that Yah is trying to do with us today uh just so we have an understanding that even after the passover is done it's never that we should we should stop thinking about what passover means along with all the feasts right we should always be uh in in some way shape or form uh meditating or thinking about all of these feasts and what they represent for us because they all point towards mashiach first and foremost and they all point towards Israel. They all point towards the bride. Uh, so in them, we can see what he's doing for us. We can see what he has done and what he will do. And we can see what we are supposed to do. We can also see what we didn't do. Uh, and then we can see the end of uh, certain ones of us if we don't prepare ourselves accordingly. This is why it's so important to keep the feast and why I never, I never understood why even in this awakening or even with the Sunday church why they say you know we shouldn't keep the feast or keeping the feast is bondage and that really is just from a lack of understanding and and not realizing that those feast days are what points to your deliver <laughs> not only that it points to how you should be preparing yourself and adorning yourself in the process that you should be going through every single year into the return of our king uh, remember, our king has gone to prepare a place for us. And now he is coming, when he comes back, uh, he is coming back for his bride. And his bride uh, uh, will have gone through the process of making herself ready. Whether or not you're a part of that, uh, we'll look at today. So uh, before we bring that out, anybody got anything, um, anything to add? Uh, anything they want us to pray for, like I said, uh, because we are still in the midst of this fast, uh, after I pray, I will open it up for everybody. There's no obligation. Uh, if nobody has anything after I pray, then I'll just get right into the message. Uh, but uh, for those who want, anybody want me to stand in the gap for them, they want me to pray for something specific, please say so. 
If not, we will get it in. All right, family. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Abba, yeah, we come before your throne right now just thanking you. Thank you for today. We thank you for the strength that you have provided to our bodies. Uh, we just thank you for, for keeping us encouraged. We thank you for bringing us forth uh, as we go through this fast. We thank you just for keeping us. Uh, uh, we thank you for being in the midst of us as we go through this. You are the one uh, who is establishing us right now. You are the one who is grounding us right now as we seek you, as we meditate on your word. Uh, uh, you are filling us up. You are edifying us. And so we just thank you right now. We know that anything that we receive from on high comes from you and it is for our good and it's not just for us but the reason why we fast the reason why we are killing this flesh the reason why uh, 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 we are are closing our mouths and not allowing substances to enter the reason why we are praying towards you uh, uh, and lifting up our voices towards you and repenting is because we know that whatever you edify us with it is for the body it is for us to go and seek those who are still lost those who have been scattered by bad shepherds uh, uh, by false prophets you are sending us out to go and preach the word to them and to edify them as we have been edified so let us just seek to examine ourselves let us uh, continue to come before you uh, 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 and, and seek judgment, not judgment for condemnation, but but that correction and that rebuke that a father does with his son. Uh, we just ask for that right now so that we may stay on the right path and we are straying in any area and we are going off the path in any way. We just pray for your correction. We pray that you would just show us uh, uh, the error of our ways and that you would show us the, the, the things we need to do. You would lead us by your instruction so that we may truly repent for even your word says that we we must bring forth fruit, meat for repentance, which means there must be action required when we repent. It's not just saying the words out of our mouth, but it is also following them indeed. That is the true sign uh, of repentance. So we just ask right now that you just cleanse our hearts, cleanse our minds. Let us continue to focus on you as we get ready to get into this word. Uh, uh, we just pray right now that each and every last one of us decrease uh, even the more in the flesh and increase in the spirit. And we just pray that whatever uh, uh, you would have for us, that you would use us all. Let us all be willing vessels. Uh, we just pray that your word will fill us all up. And whenever you have, whatever you have given us, whenever you tell us to speak, let us speak and let us do so uh, uh, for oneness. Let us do so for edification. We just thank you and we love you for what you are doing for the dedicated saints of Yah in Christ. We thank you uh, uh, for the sacrifice of our King, your only begotten Son, Yahushua. Hamashiach. We thank you for that blood that is still covering us, but allow us to see what it is to be delivered and what we should do. Uh, we know that there is a furtherance after we have been freed by that blood. So give us the instruction that we need on this night. Give us the instruction that we need in this hour to go further, to kill whatever needs to be killed so that we can be resurrected spiritually. Uh, um, uh, and that we may show ourselves approved and adorned and beautiful arrayed uh, uh, like a bride that is that is ready uh, uh, to marry a king uh, so that we may feast with you and dine with you and, 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 and live in your kingdom that you have established from the foundation forevermore. We just thank you and we love you. We give you all praise, honor, and glory. Uh, we pray for the ones that had a heart to be on and could not, and we just ask that your word reaches them wherever they are. And of course, we pray for, for the house of Israel. We pray for the remnant, the righteous remnant that you are calling into oneness. Let us all stay on that path of righteousness. Uh, we, just, we just ask right now that if there is anything that is causing us to be led to the left or to the right, that you would show those things to us, and better yet, that you would even uh, stand in, in front of us uh, to deflect those things. If there is any fiery darts, if there is any uh, a discord coming our way, any, any uh, wicked contention coming our way, uh, 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 any blaspheming coming our way, we just ask that you block it right now. Show us those individuals if need be uh, so that we may mark them for we know that you are putting together a righteous and a holy body and we know that no one, it, nobody who is seeking to divide what you are putting together uh, uh, should even be in the midst of us. So we ask that you will weed them out in this very hour uh, and you will continue to call us into peace and shalom and continue to, to, to root us and establish us in your righteousness. And we pray all this in the name of y'all. Show Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Anybody else want to pray? Anybody at all? I, I want to go ahead and. Go ahead, sis. 
First, I want to come out of um, 2 Kings 23, beginning with verse 19. And all the houses also of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made to provoke the Lord to anger, Josiah took away and did to them according to all the acts that he had done in Bethel. And he slew all the priests of the high places that were there upon the altars and burned men's bones upon them and returned to Jerusalem. And the king commanded all the people saying, keep the Passover unto the Lord your God as it is written in the book of this covenant. Surely there was not holden such a Passover from the days of the judges that judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel, nor of the kings of Judah, but in the 18th year of King Josiah, wherein this Passover was holden to the Lord in Jerusalem. Moreover, the workers with familiar spirits and the wizards and the images and the idols and all the abominations that were spied in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, did Josiah pull away or put away that he might perform the words of the law, which were written in the book that Hilkiah, the priest found in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Father Yahuwah, we just thank and praise you for this opportunity for to examine our own lives, our own temples, for um, anything and all things that are an abomination to you. Father, we thank and praise you for the example in King Josiah, who went on what could be seen as a rampage against false gods and contamination among your people and in your temple and in your, um, your holy people of Jerusalem, uh, of Judah and Israel. Help us, Father Yahuwah, to pull down false gods and exterminate every area of temple prostitution in us, your temples, our bodies, our souls, and our minds. We declare ourselves off limits to Molech offerings and Baal worship. We proclaim ourselves holy unto you, Yahuwah. We thank you for causing us and all of Israel to divest from working with familiar spirits and wizards and the images and idols and all the abominations that are in our land today, that are amongst your people today, that we don't even bat an eye at today. Help us, Father Yahuwah, to divest from these sins and the shameful deeds and to invest ourselves into holiness and into all activity that pulls down these evil things that do according to the acts of the same things that jo uh, Josiah did in Bethel. We know that we provoke you to anger when we let these ungodly things happen in our lives. And Father Yahuwah, we don't want you to be, we don't want to remain anymore on the side of your anger. We want to get on the side of your grace and your mercy. We want to observe to do all that is written in your law. And Father Yahuwah, we dedicate ourselves even just, just more, even more. And we pray. We lift up Yasharel. We lift up Israel right now to you, Father Yahuwah. And we just pray for them, for all who are being held by, um, by every contemptible spirit, by every demonic force that won't let them lift their hands to worship. We, we, we just pray and, and stand in the gap right now that as we preach this gospel, that we'll be like Yahusha, who preached the, the gospel to the poor and to the bound and set at liberty, at liberty those who were captive in the mighty name of Yahusha. And Father, we thank you that during this fast that you're sp uh, strengthening us spiritually so that we can walk this walk. And Father Yahuwah will be amongst those who will be found in the house of our Elohim doing what is written and performing it to every um, dotted I and to every crossed T. In the mighty name of Yahusha, I pray. Hallelujah. 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 Anybody else? Anybody else want to offer a prayer? All right, family. If everybody is good, let's go ahead and break some bread. Uh, we're coming from 1 Corinthians 1.10, of course. It says, now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. All right. So with that, we're going to we're going to start at Exodus 11. And I just want to establish some things first, because not only. Uh, when we look at our Passover or we look at the Passover, the actual Passover that occurred, um, 
not only was the most high, not only was he smiting our enemies or not only was he uh, uh, striking them with plagues to show Pharaoh and all those who dwelt in Egypt his power, but he was also showing us, right? For, for lack of a better, for lack of a better word, he was, he was auditioning for Israel, right? He was showing us that he could be our protector, right? And we're talking about the marriage of Yah in Israel, right? Ultimately, uh, the marriage of Hamashiach, right, in Israel. And so when we look at what he was doing here, not only was he, he was just, he was destroying them. Yeah, he was striking them. Uh, they were getting hit with these plagues. But while we were in Goshen, when we looked over, the mindset should have been like, man, look at this God that is going to deliver us. Or look at this guy who is uh, uh, striking our enemies down or, or, or sending these plagues to our enemies and we dwell safely, right? So the mindset should have been, this is an Elohim that we want to serve because we know that he ultimately will protect us against everything, right? And we know that there is no man, there is nothing that can contend or go against the Most High, that can war with him, right? Even in the scriptures, uh, we went over it this morning, he says that he is a God of war, right? And the way the Most High fights is so... Uh, it's like unfair for anybody. It's unfair for us to even try or attempt to go against the Most High because he doesn't even need, uh, he doesn't need swords. He doesn't need guns. He doesn't need tanks or nukes. He can destroy us just with elements, right? Or things of uh, that come from, from nature, period, right? He can destroy us. Uh, uh, he can smite us with darkness, right? He can destroy us. Uh, 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 with a, uh, what am I thinking of? With a famine, right? Oh, you want to come at me? You want to contend with me? You want to war with me? Okay, how about I just stop it from raining? And he won, right? Because without rain, we get no food, we have no water, and then we die out. So to go against him, there is no winning. And he was showing us that this is what I will do for you. This is what I will do on behalf of you um, if you are with me. When you enter into covenant with me, this is my promise to you that I will protect you, all right? And I will glorify you, but we'll get there. And so this was him presenting himself to us as a, um, as a husband that could protect his bride. And when we talk about this marriage, of course, we're talking spiritually. We're not talking anything uh, carnally. So, uh, you know, try not to get in that mindset because I know even for the men, I know it's kind of hard to talking about husbands and brides and stuff like that. And it's like, man, I ain't no bride. Like just, we talking spiritually, right? Um, as far as what this marriage is and what it's about. All right, so Exodus 11 and verse two, we're gonna look at this marriage and then actually see something prior to this that was, that was similar to what y'all was doing just to show you that this was a whole process. Um, and of course, at where we are now, this is before we even come out of Egypt, right? And I want you to see what he's doing. Uh, we're just gonna read one and two. Uh, it says, and the Lord said unto Moses, yet I will bring one plague more up upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterwards, he will let you go hence. When he shall let you go, he shall surely thrust you out hence altogether. Speak now in the ears of the people and let every man borrow of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor jewels of silver and jewels of gold. And so the purpose of arraying us in jewels and gold, which we covered last Thursday, I believe, was because he was adorning his bride. Even before he delivered us, he fully delivered us from our enemy, he's already dressing us up, right? He's already uh, uh, um, beautifying us and getting us ready for the ceremony, all right? Just to confirm that this actually did take place, let's go to uh, Exodus 12. And... And we'll look at uh, 
We'll start from verse 34. All right, it says, uh, Exodus 12, verse 34, it says, and the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent unto them such things as they required and they spoiled the Egyptians. So not only was it silver and gold that we were arrayed with, but understand that we also received raiment, right? So as we are coming out of Egypt, it's not like we coming out looking like bums. We are actually coming out uh, um, looking beautified, right? We are actually coming out uh, as royalty, if you want to put it that way, right? Being being decked out in ornaments and jewels of silver and gold, and then also uh, um, clean raiment. All right, now I want us to take a look at something that is similar to this uh, on a natural level, just so we can see what Yah was actually doing and that this is what he was actually doing, all right? Because there's one other case that we could point to where we know this is exactly what happened. Does anybody know what that is? Anybody care to guess what that is? Who else did this happen to? You don't know, it's cool, you're gonna read it. Let's go to, um, let's go to Genesis 24. Uh, we'll start from verse 45, just to get a little context. So we know um, that when Abraham, right, after after uh, Sarah died, Abraham's wife, um, we know that Isaac was in mourning. Uh, Abraham is in his old age. And then he calls his servant and he tells his servant to go back to his homeland to find a bride for his son, right? And then he gives him. Uh, um, he he forces him, or he has him swear an oath. Doesn't force him, but he has his, he has him swear an oath, and then he tells him uh, because the servant asks, "Well, if I go and I don't find anybody, then you know what does that mean?" And he said, "Well, if you go and you don't find anybody, the Most High doesn't lead you to the person that is is right for my son, then this oath is is null and void, pretty much." So as he goes on his journey, of course, he asks for these signs so that he knows. Uh, that this is the right woman and when we get into the signs there are reasons why he chose those things because um that was telling him that that the woman for isaac had a had a mind uh to serve and to minister unto him um uh, and would be a comfort to him uh and not someone who would lead him uh astray or someone who would burden him down right she was going to be a true help me and so that's why he was looking for her or he was looking for one that was going to feed not only him, but his camels also, uh, and things of that nature. All right. So when we get here, I want us to look at uh, what the servant does with Rebecca before she goes to Isaac. All right. Uh, starting at verse 45, it says, And before I had done speaking in my heart, behold, Rebecca came forth with her pitcher on her shoulder. And she went down unto the well and drew water. And I said unto her, let me drink, I pray thee. And she made haste and let down her pitcher from her shoulder and said, drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. So I drank and she made the camels drink also. And I asked her and said, whose daughter art thou? And she said, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bare unto him. And I put the airy upon her face and the bracelets upon her hand. Let's keep going. 48, it says, Then I bowed down my head and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham, which had led me in the right way to take my master's brother's daughter unto his son. And now if ye will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, 
the thing proceeded from the Lord, we cannot speak unto thee bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before thee. Take her and go and let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord has spoken. And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshiped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth, 53 is key, and the servant brought forth what? Jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah. He gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. So before the servant is going to take Rebekah to Isaac, what is he making sure he does? He's making sure that he beautifies her, right? That he uh that he adore he adorns her, right? That he decks her out in, in jewels or uh uh yeah, jewels of silver and jewels of gold, and that he gives her fresh raiment so that when she comes to Isaac, she is already a presentable bride. And then we know uh we keep reading that when she when she came to him. Um, you know, they, they immediately got married, you know, then they consummated the marriage, so on and so forth, right? Um, and so this is just to show you that when we go to Exodus and we read that Exodus 11 and then that Exodus 12, this is what Yah is doing with Israel. Before he takes us to the spot or before he has Moses take us to the spot where he is going to uh, uh, ultimately marry Israel, he is adorning Israel first. He is beautifying them first. Now, um, this is all beautiful because now we see that he's shown us that he can deliver us. He's shown us his might. And then he's also uh, um, um, shown us that he could bring us out with great provision and that he is uh, he's going to lead us in God. He's going to be our deliverer. All the things uh, um, that we will want in the Elohim, he's going to be for us. Right. And so now when we do the Passover and we see that we are delivered by the blood and the slaying of the lamb, right? Now we see that we have been set free and are, um, are now clear to go and pursue Elohim with all of our heart, mind, and soul. The only problem is, is that when Israel came out, they did not understand what was happening to they did not understand what was fully happening they didn't understand uh, um they didn't understand that they were being freed uh and they were about to enter into a covenant with with the one and true elohim they didn't have a full understanding of of his of his power and uh the provision that he could provide and that there's no need to murmur and complain all you have to do is just ask him or go before him and he will do it because he's shown you not only his strength, but he's shown you um, that he uh, uh, um, he's showing you that he can he can provide substance. He's showing you that he can be there, right? So they didn't understand that, but nevertheless, Yah continues to take them through the process of being married. All right, and we're gonna continue to look at it. Let's go to um, Exodus 14. You want us to see this? Because everything that we're looking at is everything that a bride would do before a wedding. And then we're going to see the actual uh, ceremony, um, the actual wedding, and then what happens after the wedding, right? When we talk about sealing the covenant, we're going to look at all of that. All right, just land some groundwork. Good, yeah, okay. All right, what did I say? Exodus 14. <clears throat> All right, Exodus 14, and we're just going to read. Uh, see what I want. That's not what I want. That's not what I want. Hold on. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, it is Exodus 14. All right, Exodus 14, uh, starting at verse 21. We're going to read 21 and 22. All right. It says, And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry. 
and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground and the waters were, were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. So we know that we were being pursued by the Egyptians. Pharaoh, his heart was hardened. He started to pursue us right at that time. Uh, we automatically, we already started to doubt the Most High saying, oh, he has let us out of Egypt to be destroyed, right? Because now they're being, they're pursuing us. And then we know that uh, uh, Moses said, no, stand still and see the salvation. And then we saw this miracle happen. But what did this miracle represent? You can tell me. What did this, what did us crossing the Red Sea represent? Let's read it. Uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Oh, you got something up? Go ahead. Steve, you got something? You lit up. Okay. I was thinking it, it represented like a baptism. Absolutely. It absolutely represents a baptism. Hallelujah. So we've been adorned, we come out, and then what does the most high have us do? Or what does the most high uh, do for us? He cleanses us, right? He washes us. All right, let's look at this. So we're just going to look at the first two two uh, verses, but we're going to come back here towards the end so we can see the whole thing. Uh, what I said, 1 Corinthians 10. I'm going to say Corinthians. Woo, what? All right. It says, moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drink of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. So we know that it was Christ with us in the wilderness and we know that when we crossed through that, that Red Sea, right, that that was a baptism. Now, what does the baptism represent? It represents us leaving bondage, right? It represents us leaving uh, captivity and then walking into freedom. So what that was supposed to symbolize is that us as a nation, we were going to cross over to the other side and we were supposed to come out as a new creature. We were supposed to come out with a new mindset. Because once we got on the other side of the Red Sea and we saw that he literally destroyed our enemies by having those waves crash down on them. And so they are no longer a threat. Then that should have just sealed it right there. And we should have been like, OK, this is our Elohim. Because not only has he shown us the plagues, not only has he delivered us right with a strong hand. Right. We follow his commandments. We put the blood on the doorpost. He brought us out. He led us to the to the Red Sea. We thought that that was our destruction. But then he showed forth that miracle and then destroyed our enemies in the process. That's my element. Right. That is who I want to be joined with or yoked to for the rest of my life. That should have been it. That should have been all that we needed to see in order to in order to fully commit to the most high. Right. Go ahead, sis. Sorry, I was just um, going down a rabbit hole there, but I, I saw a simila similarity when you were talking about the, pat the um, parting of the Red Sea, and it mm -hmm. brought me back to um, Genesis 15 when, um, when Abba uh, had um, um, Abraham to, to get the doves and the items, and then he made a path, and then he sent a pillar of fire between them. And it kind of reminded me of what, what happened with um, the passing of the Red Sea. And that was the same reference when he was telling him that your people were going to go into cap in captivity into 400, for 400 years and then they were going to come out. So those two, to me, based on that, are actually tied together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that's not, and that is 
even with that, when we look at Exodus, he does it again when we go to take Jericho, right? Because remember that everybody who came out, none of them were going to enter into the land. And so um, before we took Jericho, what did we do? There's two things that we did before we took Jericho. That's very important. Go ahead, Ock. No, no, finish, finish your thought, finish your thought. I just want to capitalize on something that the sister just said, but finish your thought about Jericho. Okay, okay. Uh, Cody, Virginia, you have some? I forget the name of the stream that we had to pass under, but there was another stream that Joshua had to take the people through. And um, of course there was a sin with uh, Aiken. Right, right, right. But before we did that, before we passed over the waters, there was two things that we did, right, that was important. And I'll just go ahead and say it so my aunt can, uh, can elaborate. We kept the Passover, right, and unleavened bread, and they circumcised. The uh, They circumcised all the men. Um, and this is before we took Jericho. So it was the same mindset and that going throughout the wilderness, right, having that covenant established. But he said, before you go into the promised land, right, circumcise the men and then keep Passover and then we pass through the waters again and went to go take Jericho. That's why when you see what Achan did, it just makes no sense because again, he has shown you, right? Again, he has shown you a true miracle when it comes to the priest uh, parting that parting that water, them all coming across, then us walking around Jericho and then the walls coming down and to go in and actually touch the accursed thing and try to hide it from the most high right, try to seek your own, you see why the judgment that he got was necessary. And we're going to get into that at the very end of that when we talk about presumptuous sin. We started it last week. We're going to finish it up, right, and go into what that really looks like. But just understand that that, again, was us walking in newness, right? That was us being uh, uh, washed and then going to conquer, all right? Um, Ah, right, what you got? Uh, <laughs> man, it's good. Look, what you, everything, man, it's beautiful. What the sister brought out, look. So we can't start at Exodus, right? It starts back in Genesis, right? And what uh, a coach mentioned he brought out, I mean, if, if, if we start way back in the garden, but especially when you get Abraham to understand what he's going through uh, the, the, those animals, he, he, he's setting us up for Exodus, but Exodus is setting us up for the Messiah. But what happens is, if we don't understand what happened with Abraham, that covenant right there, Mount Sinai, Moses, Red Sea, none of that stuff is, is going to elude the mind. And then when you get Messiah, you ain't going to understand nothing. And that's what's going on with our brothers and sisters today. Because they're starting at Moses and Mount, not Mount Sinai and the Passover and not understanding what happened in the garden, not understanding what happened with Abraham. Then when they get to Moses, by trying to get to Jesus, Yahshua, it's all confusing. But you have to start right at Abraham and in that garden. In the Passover, it means something totally different than not, not something totally different, but it's it's all by faith, man. And it's just way deep. But I just I didn't, I'm gonna stop, but what the sister brought out just brought out so much stuff in my mind. And I'm, I'm gonna let you finish, but good stuff, sis, with that Abraham. Nah. Nah, you're absolutely right on it. And it brings up a lot of stuff in my mind, too, because when you look at that uh, covenant that was made, the reason why the Most High can show us grace and mercy is because of that covenant. <laughs> the, the reason why the Most High can, the reason why we have grace and, grace and mercy is because of that covenant and Yah's brilliance and understanding man's heart, right? Obviously, he understands us, he created us. But um, when you read back in, in Genesis, right, we're going all the way back. I'm trying not to trail off too far. When you go back in Genesis and you're looking at Noah, right, after they came off of the ark, he says, I will not flood the earth again because I see that man's heart is what? Evil continually. And so now when we flash forward to Abraham and he's making this covenant, he understood that I cannot make this covenant with man. Right. I cannot make this covenant, meaning me and Abraham can't go through this. Right. Because if me and Abraham go through this and we both take this oath. 
right? Because what that covenant signifies is that if if the rules of that covenant is broken, then what you see, the animals, what happened to the animals is going to happen to you, right? So if he allows Abraham to walk through those uh those animals that were cut in two, the moment we murmured and complained, it would have been a wrap. The Most High would have had to kill us. <laughs> he would have had to destroy us because we broke the rules of the covenant. But it says because he couldn't, because he could swear by no no one greater, who did he swear by? He swore by himself. And so because he made a covenant unto himself and he promised to us, right, everything that he that he promised Abraham uh, that we would be fruitful and multiply, that, you know, royal priesthood, all of those things, he can now fulfill that and show his grace and mercy. Why? Because he is the author of the covenant. He is the one who signed the covenant. He is the judge of the covenant. He's everything. And so now if he chooses to show grace and mercy, then he can, right? Because he swore by himself and because he has not went against his word, nor will he ever. That is why we can even have grace and mercy today. That's why we got it in the wilderness. And man, we're getting too deep into that. I'm going to try not to trail off. <laughs> and we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that, to the, the, the calf that was built, too. But when we built the calf. Right. And. Y'all wanted to destroy Israel, and he told Moses, I will I will make you a greater nation. I will bring another people that's greater than them and build you a nation, right? What did Moses put him in remembrance of? Or what did Moses bring to his attention? What did he what did he bring up to him or offer up to him? The covenant. And so when when Yah shows us mercy and it says that he turned back, he still judged us. Right. It was still it was still people that, that was slain, still people that died. But he showed us grace and mercy and we were able to still abide with him because he has the right to do that. Right. As long as he doesn't go uh, against his word and against what he has promised us, he has the right to do whatever he wants. When it comes to grace and mercy, when it comes to leniency. Right. And this is something that a lot of people don't understand. Like. Whew, all right. Um, so I don't even know where we was at, man. That was some good stuff. Oh, okay, we was talking about we was talking about the water. All right. So now we see the water, we see the cleansing, and that was good stuff. Says you got more mind like racing right now. It's probably just the lack of food. I can't even keep myself focused. It's trailing. But um, <laughs> when we when we look at this water, understand that that is a washing. Like that is a that is a cleansing. We were supposed to come out a new creature, ready to be presented to our husband ready to be married off ready to be uh ready to enter into this covenant right so we see the adorning we see the washing now let's go to uh let's go to exodus 24. right we know in exodus 19 we know that he said hey go to the elders and, and Tell them if they if they obey everything that I tell them to do, this is what I'm going to do for them. And they said, yes, we will. And then what did he do? He, he said, sanctify yourselves. So we've already been washed. We've been uh, uh, we've been decked out in jewels. And now he's saying sanctify yourselves. And then he told them to come to the mountain on the next day. And then we know that that is where he was going to give us the vows, which we know are the commandments. Right. These are the house rules. These are the things that we must do in order to stay in the Most High's graces. And then he told us what he would do if we obey him. Right. Now, let's look at this. Exodus 24. Exodus 24. Matter of fact, real quick, real quick, real quick. Let's go to Exodus 20. We're going to go towards the end because I want us to see this as well. Right. When we come to him, um, and he is now giving us. He's given us the vows. He's given us the house rules, given us the commandments, the things that we need in order to stay in covenant with him, in order to stay in, in obedience with him. Right. Let's take a look at it. Let's start at verse at verse 18. because This is important. All right. It says in uh, all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise 
of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, speak thou with us and we will hear. But let not God speak with us lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, fear not, for God has come to prove you. And that his fear may be before your faces that ye sin not. He has come to prove you. He has come to uh, uh, try your heart, right? He has come to uh, 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 test you. And he has come to introduce himself and let you know that he ain't the one to play with. That is what Moses is telling them. He coming to prove you. and He coming to let you know that this is a serious thing, just like what? Marriage. When you come before a marriage, those vows that we recite to one another, it ain't just for play play, right? Those vows is not just, oh, uh, it's not just helpful hints. It's not just suggestions. Those vows are promises to one another. And those promises that you make to one another is to what? Death. And so when we look at this covenant, he's saying that he is going to prove you. He's giving you the words of the covenant. and he needs you to hear his voice so that he can prove you and show you that he ain't playing, show you how serious this is, right? But yet they didn't want to hear him. Let's keep reading. 21, it says, and the people stood afar off and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. And the Lord said unto Moses, thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Ye shall not make with me God, gods of silver, neither shall you make unto you gods of gold. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shall sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings, thy sheep, and thy oxen. In all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. So everywhere that we went, we were going to build what? An altar to meet the Most High and to offer up sacrifices to him, right? Peace offerings and burnt offerings to him. Wherever he recorded his name, we were going to construct an altar, and that is where you meet him, right? We're going to get there. Now let's go to Exodus 24. Because once he has given all the instruction to Moses, he then commands Moses to go into the people and we're going to see that the full marriage, right? How we how we think of it Hebraically, we're going to see that every custom within that marriage, within a, a marriage happened, right? All the way from the adorning to the washing to uh um to the consummation uh to the signing of the covenant, right? We're going to see all that. Well, we've already seen portions of it. Now we're going to see the conclusion of it. Uh, 24, starting at verse 1, it says, And he said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come not. Neither shall the people go up with him. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord, and all the judgments, and all the people answered, with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord have said, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said will we do and be obedient, right? They signed the covenant agreement, right? Uh, uh, some people would, would call it today, or we know that over in Africa, uh, they would call it a ketubah, right? Which is just a, a, a contract. Um, and so it has on there everything that both parties are going to do. And then you agree to it and you sign it and you do it amongst witnesses, right? 
Now, who are our witnesses as we are agreeing to this covenant? Heaven and earth. Heaven and earth bear witness of everything that we are saying so that we are without excuse. Right? Now, let's look at the fullness of this. We said that we will do, we will be obedient. Verse 8, and Moses took the blood, and he did what? Sprinkled it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord have made with you concerning all these words. See, the blood that we put on the doorpost was for our deliverance, but there is another, there is in another instance, blood that is sprinkled on us that does what? Seal the covenant. Right? That is an illustration of consummating the marriage. We know that when uh, a man marries his bride, they go into the wedding chamber, right? And then um, you're going to have witnesses or you're going to have the, uh, uh, the sheep brought to the father of the bride that actually proves or um, that confirms that she was a virgin, right? That confirms um, that she had not been with anybody else. Right. And there there's reasons why. And uh, I believe I just went into that a couple of times as far as, you know, if they try to come back and lie and things like that, then you can bring that to them uh, in order to in order to uh, justify uh, the bride. They try to say that she's played the harlot. So we know that before this, we were in bondage. So now we've been freed from bondage. We've been cleansed. We've been decked out in jewels. And so we are considered new creatures. And so when the most high marries us consummates the marriage, right? Sprinkles us with the blood, which seals the covenant. Blood in, blood out, all right? So y'all deliver Israel, right? Watch them, sanctify them. And then what do we do? We go and play the harlot, right? And the reason why, um, the reason why I'm bringing this message to you is because Israel is doing the same thing now. We're going through the same process, right? We know that the blood has freed us. We know that we have been baptized with the Ruach HaKodesh. We know that we have been baptized with his Holy Spirit, right? And so we are supposed to be walking in newness of life. We are supposed to be new creatures putting away the old man. But yet what we are finding in Israel is that they are awakening to truth receiving truth right entering into this covenant understanding what is on the line and then going to play the harlot all right and it's because they do not have a full understanding of um or what i believe is not for not for all some do and those those have their part in the lake but for some they just don't understand what this covenant is about they don't understand how precious this covenant is. They don't understand the grace and mercy that is involved with it. They don't understand how righteous it is. So they are using what the Most High has given them and they are worshiping idols or they are using what the Most High has put within them and they are using it to serve other gods, right? They are using it to uh, uh, um, creep off with another, another person, another man. Right. Just like Israel did. And this is what we have to make sure that we don't do, because what they did was they got caught up in the glitz and the glamour and they didn't understand that the Most High wasn't playing with them. And he's not playing with us now. And so even though we have been decked out with spiritual gifts, right, we have the ability to sing. We have the ability to preach. We have the ability uh, uh, to speak in tongues, to heal and do all these things. A lot of us are getting caught up in the fact that we have these gifts and we think that that is going to be our ticket to salvation. But the Most High is saying, no, but you still creeping around. And if you continue to creep around, I am going to deal with you. I am going to destroy you because you're so focused on the gift, you're forgetting about the actual covenant. You're forgetting about uh, uh, you're forgetting about the altar. You're forgetting about the temple and keeping those things pure and clean and holy, set apart. And that is what Israel did. They entered into an agreement. They accepted it. They were happy, right? They were rejoicing. They were free, 
And then because, because they now were free and it was just like, oh man, we, we just on top of the world now, right? We are royal priesthood, right? We about to go into the land flowing with milk and honey. Oh, let us just act the fool. And the most high had to deal with them accordingly and he's dealing with us accordingly, right? And so this is what we got to understand when it comes to Israel. Let's go to, uh, let's go to Exodus 32. Let's just read this real quick so we understand what they did. Because this was so, it was so uh, disrespectful. Um, if this happened to anybody in the flesh, like you would be broken. You would be moved to wrath just like y'all was. Because they didn't just go and play the harlot. They went and, and uh, they went and married another god right they went and had another ceremony with another god right after they had just went through the ceremony with yah go ahead koti i was just gonna say they 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 took the um the covenant but they weren't ready to be married only two people were actually ready to be married at the end of the day right. so we right. need to consider before we take covenants before we um make vows with yah um, not only do we have we have to be prepared, we have to be ready. You just don't jump into a marriage without thinking about it and considering it. Right, right. And so we looked at everything that he did for us, and we just assumed that he was going to continue doing it just as long as as you know we was alive, right? We didn't understand what was really on the table, and that when he was telling us these things, that there was going to be consequences and judgments that he was going to keep. And see, that's the beautiful thing that sets us apart. Uh, that's the beautiful thing that sets uh, Yah apart from everything else, is that he is not a man that he should lie. His word is not going to return void. So when we read his instruction, please believe that that word, whatever the judgment is attached uh, to that commandment, is going to come to pass. A lot of people still think that eye for an eye is not on the table, but it is. When Hamashiach comes back, he is going to avenge every innocent drop of blood. This is why I said that the blood is going to be raised to the horse's bridle because he is going to bring judgment according to what? What has been done. So if you live by the sword, when he gets back, you're going to die by the sword. All right? So even though uh, we have that grace and mercy now and that we're not actually uh, uh, we're not actually following that like to the letter. It's still going to take place. And this is why he told you show mercy unto your neighbor. Right. If they did it accidentally, if they accidentally punch you in the eye. Don't just be like, all right. Right. You're ready. Like, nah, if they said, hey, I'm sorry, my bad. I ain't mean to do it. Then you should be willing to let the let it go. You should be willing to forgive. Right. I don't want to get too far. All right. So when we look at when we look at what Israel did, understand we just we skipping through uh, because I want to get I want to get this. Uh, um, I want to get all the way through this. All right. When we look at at what's taking place here, Moses has been called up to actually receive the writings on uh, the tables of stone and to bring them back down to Israel so they can be taught. Right. Not just for the ones who are there now, but throughout generations. That's what they were going to be for. That's why he told them about the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant and all those things, right? Because these things were going to be with us throughout our generations so that we would never go astray. It will always be there for our learning, all right? But once he left, the people started to get restless. And even though they had just went through this whole ceremony, um, because the part that we didn't read in Exodus 24 is that after that, they had a feast. After he sprinkled them with the blood, they dined. So it was a whole ceremony. They just did all that. They're rejoicing. All of that is over with now. Moses is up uh, uh, getting the rest of the instruction from Yah, and then the people get restless, and now they just want to switch things up, right? They want to rebel. But let's see how they did it, because like I said, this is just like the ultimate disrespect. Remember everything that we just read uh, when it comes to the altar, when it comes to, to the um, to the vows, all that stuff like that. Right? Remember all of that. We're going to start at verse one. Folks. Exodus 32, it says, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him. 
up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And then verse five is just like the, the most efficient thing, right? And Aaron saw it and he did what? Built an altar. We know an altar is where the two people are going to meet in order to what? Enter into that covenant, right? Here, of course, they, that's where they're going to offer up the sacrifice, but that's what that signifies, right? The binding of that covenant at the altar. So it says, when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. So not, not uh, uh, what, 40 days after entering into this covenant, do they go and play the harlot and not only play the harlot, but marry off to another God. And I want us to see this in a spiritual sense because this is something that we do within our hearts. Please understand that now that Hamashiach is coming, now that his blood is what covers us, we are the tabernacle. Right. Your heart is the altar. Your heart and your mind, which which technically are the same thing when we talk about in the Hebraic sense. Right. Is the altar. The altar in the tabernacle are supposed to remain pure, holy, set apart. And solely dedicated to the most high for his will to be done. Anything that we offer up, anything that we give, it should be given unto him. But we have, right, uh, uh, we have allowed wickedness to creep into our tabernacles. We have allowed evil thoughts to consume us and rest on our hearts. And then we start to serve idols within our mind and pollute our temples and desecrate the altar that is supposed to be dedicated to Yah. So even though we have all these gifts, even though we are arrayed, right, we are using those gifts to what? Serve sin. We're using those gifts to, uh, in a spiritual sense, build calves. And we're saying that these things be our gods. These things are what we will worship. And so because we can sing now we are a slave or now we idolize the music industry, and we say this is our God. This is the one that is bringing me out of bondage. Do we not say that as a people? Anybody who enters into uh, uh, any major sport, anybody who enters into the music industry, what do they say? Oh, this is this allowed me to free my family. This allowed me to bring my family or get them out of the hood, right? This allowed me to uh, uh, support them. So they're looking at something else that is outside of the Most High. They're using a gift that was given to them by the Most High, and they're serving that thing. And so because of that, they will have no part in the kingdom unless they repent and they cleanse their temples and their altars. And so that is something that we have to be careful of. Because although we might not be in the world, we might not be um, um, in the music industry, uh, I don't think any of us is play, playing a, a major sport, right? Uh, so we ain't got them kind of dollars, but we can also have idols within our heart. We can also desecrate our altar and pollute our temple and end up serving something that is outside of the most high. And we do not understand what sets us apart or what makes us holy. Right. It is his word. It is his command. Those are the things that that cleans us up. Those are the things that continue uh, they continue to wash us, but when we allow other things to enter in, and then we start thinking on, uh, uh, we start thinking on those things, and we start committing sins, then we start to desecrate our altar, and you risk being cut off. Because what's going to happen is the more and more that you take in, 
the more and more that you serve sin or the more and more that you uh, you think on sin, right? Uh, the more that's going to boil up and the more you're just going to act it out without a, without a care, without a thought. Just in sheer rebellion. Right? And that is the definition of presumptuous sin, but we're going to get there. I just want y'all to see this, that they got married. Then as soon as they thought that Moses was gone, not even paying attention to, to the Most High, where they was like, let us get remarried. Let us enter into another covenant. And so the Most High wanted to destroy them. Yeah, because how do you go and play the harlot that quickly? How do you forsake me that quickly with everything that I just did, right? So with everything that the Most High has brought us out of, everything that he has delivered us from, we can't, we can't be turned away so quickly by just things of the world. Right. By just uh, uh, um, these these minor trials and tribulations, people coming against us, people lying on us, people uh, trying to kill us. We already know what the world is trying to do towards us. We can't soon be turned aside from the most high and thinking that he's not going to be our protector. Right. But that's what Israel is doing. And we have to stop. Right. We have to stop that. We have to look towards him. We went into that. Uh, was it this morning we went into that? The most high will fight for you as long as you got a pure heart. As long as you have a, a perfect heart and you are walking towards him and seeking him out, he will protect you. All right. Now, let's go and look at uh, Hamasha. I want us to see this. Uh, we're going to go to Matthew 22. Because like I said, we went through the Passover. We came out of the Passover. And then yet we still committed wickedness because of a lack of understanding. And so now that we're entering into the Passover, even if you have an understanding of what the Passover is, right? I'm going to show you how you can quickly be turned aside and you can quickly uh, uh, worship idols within your heart if you don't understand what is supposed to happen after the Passover. After you have been passed over, what should be your mindset? Right. What should be our mindset as we come out of Passover? We should continue the process of what? Making ourselves ready, of adorning ourselves. But we can easily fall off that and we get if we get caught up in pride and we get caught up in selfishness and we get caught up in jealousy. All of these things, when they creep in, they keep us from adorning ourselves. They actually stain us. Right. They create blemishes. And then we have to be washed all over again, which is the, the act of repentance. And so we're not careful and we don't examine ourselves and we continue to walk in that, then you walk in towards destruction, right? The Pharisees and the Sadducees were doing just that. So when Amashiach came on the scene, he had to chastise them and he had to tell them or call them out for being hypocrites for doing exactly what I'm saying. All right, let's look at it. And this is what we have to be careful of. When it comes to the feast days, when it comes to keeping these, these holy moeds, Please understand, it is about Hamashiach, it is about his word, first and foremost, all that other stuff can go by the wayside, all right? It is, it is not, there's nothing wrong with wanting to present yourself or wanting to dress nice. There's nothing wrong with wanting to have a uh, uh, extravagant feast where it looks beautiful and things like that. But when that starts to take precedence over the word, then we risk going off. We are then heading into destruction, uh, destruction if we don't repent. Right. And it's easy to have it's easy to let happen uh, when you don't examine yourselves. Right. Or when you think you just got it, when you think you're good because the most high has called you to fill a certain position. He has anointed you to do a certain thing. You start to get self-righteousness, start to get a big head and you stop checking yourself. And then lo and behold, you walking in darkness. Right. Uh, what you got? Shalom, family. Got a question for you. Uh, what's the uh, best way that if you were to help someone understand having a pure heart? What would you say would be the best example? I mean, you might already be leaning towards it, going into that, but yeah, yeah, yeah. As yeah, we yeah. go through this captivity and we going through all these brands that we're dealing with and all these things that we get attached onto, and our likes and our understanding of things are getting constantly manipulated. How do we know how to break ourselves down so we can actually understand how to have a clean heart? That's just right. my thought. Yep. No, that's a, that's an excellent question. Excellent question. Right, we gonna get to it. Because it's one thing just to say, hey, have a clean heart. 
right? <laughs> Purify your tabernacle. But how do you do so? We're going to look at it because the word just tells you clearly on how to cleanse yourself, right? The process of cleansing yourself is repentance, but there are things that we have to walk in and things that we have to abstain from in order to keep ourselves clean. Remember when we were when we were coming out of Egypt and we were in the wilderness, all the Most High was instructing us to do was to purify ourselves. He was just giving us instruction on how to get clean and stay clean, right? So what was he doing specifically? Telling us not to follow in the ways of those who already did wickedness, those who we were already going in to destroy because of their wickedness. And then he was telling us his heart. He was telling us what he sees or what he views as righteous and what he views as holy and pure. And as long as you walk in that, you should have what? Long lasting life. It's very simple, right? But we're gonna break it down. Uh, we're gonna break it down in the word. We're gonna look at it, right? Because it's important to see it. You have to examine yourself according to the scripture, right? I may be able to look at you and see one thing that you're doing wrong, but when you are in this word and when you are going before the most high and you are seeking him and asking him to search you to see if there is anything that he sees that is wrong, that he will tell you everything that needs to be fixed. It's going to be in a process of time, but he is the ultimate corrector. He is the one who can show you everything that you are doing um, that has caused you not to walk in perfection, right? He tells you exactly how to cleanse your heart, right? And how to clean that altar. All right, let's look at it. Matthew 22. Uh, we'll start it at, we'll start at verse one. It says, and Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, uh, the king, oh, I'm not in Matthew 22, I'm in Matthew, hold up, Matthew 23, Matthew 23. I'm so sorry, family. I'm so sorry. Uh, Matthew 23, we're going to start at, yeah, we're going to start at verse one. All right. It says, then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All, therefore, whosoever they, they bid you, or uh, whatsoever they bid you, observe. That observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and, and grievous to be born and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers, but all their works they do for it to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and, and, and enlarge the borders of their garments and the love of the uppermost rooms and love the uppermost rooms at feasts in the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, rabbi, rabbi, which is to say master, master. So what was he trying to tell his disciples, right? He is correcting them in this very moment. He's saying that when they are reading from the instruction manual, from the blueprint, right? When they are reading from the manuscript, he says, hear and do. He said, but when that book closed, when they stop reading from the words of the Most High, he says, do not do the things that they do. And this is why, right? They add on burdens to the people. And then they are prideful and puffed up and that everything that they do, they do it to be seen of men. And if we take a close look at Israel and examine Israel very close, that is exactly where we are headed. That is exactly what Israel is walking in. When it comes to feast days, the importance is not being put on the word for the most part. I'm not saying we're the only ones doing it. I know there are many uh, righteous brothers and sisters out there doing that. but the bulk of Israel is putting the actual feast or the um, the physical things before the spiritual things, right? They're putting uh, the dress, the dress code, the raiment before the word. They're putting uh, the venue before the word, the meal before the word, the decorations before the word. All of those things they are putting before the word, even themselves. Right. Because nowadays you have people who are esteeming themselves uh, to a, a um, they're esteeming themselves in ways that the most high never even commanded. 
right? Calling themselves generals and things of that nature, right? Giving themselves titles so that they could do what? Lord over men. And so the reason why or how they got to that point is because first off, there's no self-examination and there's no correction going on, right? And because they think that because they're Israel and because there are spiritual gifts promised to them, because I'm pretty sure if you go into those assemblies that do those things, they still got people who can sing. They still got people who can teach. They still have people who can, uh, um, they still have people who can do all manner of works. You might even have people who can heal. You might have people who can cast out devils within these assemblies, but they are thinking that that is their righteousness. And because they see these things going forth or because they have people who can teach, they have a gift of gab, right? They can speak very well, that they think that this is the righteous place to be, even though the word is not there, even though a, a man is powerful and puffed up and putting themselves before the word. And so if we don't examine ourselves according to the scripture to make sure, to make sure that we are putting him first in all things, even when we keep the feast, what's the most important thing about the feast? Not what I'm wearing, right? Not what I'm wearing, not how good the venue looks, right? Not if so-and-so is performing or gonna be there or whatever, those aren't the things that we should be looking at. It should be, what should I be doing leading up to it? And then when I get there, what am I to receive out of the word that's gonna be given, right? It's not even about the food when you go to a feast. It is the instruction and the word that comes first, that spiritual edification before you even feed uh, your physical body, all right? But these men were powerful and puffed up and they sought the physical um, over the spiritual, all right? Uh, verse seven, it says, uh, or verse eight, it says, but be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And so you don't see that. You don't see that amongst Israel enough as far as returning to the mind of servant, right? Serving the people first, trying to restore the people first, trying to uh, uh, heal these people first and pray for people first. Um, we're not doing those things. We are seeking our own self-worth. There was a video that I just saw not too long ago uh, that a brother sent me where you had two camps standing across from each other and they cursing each other out. Cursing each other out. Like, I mean, at every curse word known to man, calling it to them as if they're about to fight and both of them are supposed to be standing. They're supposed to be standards for you yeah. Right. And so we see ourselves going on what? That same cycle. We've been woken up. We understand that we've been freed by this blood and that that is what um, allows us to pursue Hamashiach. But then we don't have an understanding of the responsibility once we enter in the covenant. And so we misuse and abuse it. So I beseech you all, please, please, uh, as we lead up, as we're in this fast, Continue to self-examine, uh, continue to search yourself and make sure that these things are not found in you uh, because um, if they are and they stay and you do not seek to have them removed, it's just going to boil. It's going to boil, it's going to boil, and then eventually you will enter into a full-blown rebellion. You know who, uh, who did just that? King Saul, right? King Saul, because he didn't want to correct himself, because he didn't want to repent, everything within him just continued to fill up until he just rebelled completely and totally, right? His last act before he died was going to see a witch to get a word from the Most High, right? And he was the king over Israel. And so that's how quickly that can happen if uh, we don't check ourselves, right? According to the word. All right. Um, uh, let's get to your uh, let's get to your question. Hopefully we can answer it right here. Let's go to First uh, Corinthians ten. We're gonna go back there, and we're gonna start from one and run it down because um, this should give us the understanding of what we need to do 
It should give us the understanding of what we need to do um, in order to stay in Christ, right? In order to have Mashiach reside in us, to have our altars remain pure, all right? We're gonna go to two places. Matter of fact, this is the, this is the first one, but we're gonna go somewhere else after this. <clears throat> Hallelujah. All right, First Corinthians, First Corinthians 10, starting at verse one. Uh, it says, moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all, all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. So what does that tell us? When we read that verse right there, the first thing that pops into my mind is I need to go and examine the evil things that they walked according to so that I can make sure I what? Don't walk into those things, right? Because the walk in those things, just by uh, uh, just by what Paul is saying, is going to get you overthrown and destroyed. And so the first thing that we should do is go back and see what did they walk in that the most I had to destroy them. Okay, let me refrain from doing that. I know that judgment is going to be near. Now he's going to list these things, but we should read them in detail. This is why we should always go back. This is one complete book. Line upon line, precept upon precept, we should go through this thing and learn uh, of Yah and what he, what he desires of us, what he requires of us. Verse 7, it says, uh, neither be ye adult, uh, idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and 20,000. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmur and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for examples and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So, what is the first part? How do we uh how do we cleanse our, our altars or how do we keep it cleansed? How do we keep our, our, our tabernacle clean, right? And our altar pure and holy and sanctified. We have to examine the things that the most high has told us not to walk in. Right? We have to look at the examples of those who have done wickedness in the sight of the most high. And then we have to refrain from doing those same things, because although we might not walk under uh, some of these things, there are some that may fit. And if they do, then you have to repent immediately and go before the Most High and seek to have that removed. Right. Some of us might not walk in idolatry or fornication, but a lot of us murmur. And we don't understand how how much the Most High despise despises those who murmur when he's working on your behalf because to murmur and complain when he is providing is to say that the substance that you are giving me is not good enough right and so anytime we have that thought process of that mindset the most high is going to uh he's going to chastise us all right he's going to whoop us if we still don't repent he'll continue to whoop you he'll continue to show forth that grace and mercy continue to bring correction Continue to bring people. Somebody will come with you with a word, and they'll bring that out, saying, "Oh man, you might want to, you might want to address this. You might want to deal with this, right?" You murmur and complain uh, uh, often. You know that's not what y'all, what y'all likes, right? You know that that's not, um, um, that that's not pleasing to his sight. Somebody might bring you that word. You still don't repent. You still don't turn. And then sooner or later, he's gonna be like, "Okay, you want to walk that way? Go walk that way." Right. I'm going to stay right here. As long as you want to you want to keep doing wickedness, you want to keep doing the things that I don't like, then just keep going. You just got to get out the house. Because now you reach a point where you're just doing things willfully. And once that happens, you got to get out. Right. Same thing with a parent and their child. Hey, I'm more than happy to correct you. Right. If you make mistakes, I'm going to correct you. 
I ain't gonna just kick you out because you made a mistake, even if you do it over and over again, right? We still have that compassion because they are our children. But the moment your child is gonna come to you and tell you, I don't wanna follow your rules anymore, right? I don't wanna do what you tell me to do, I'm gonna do what I wanna do, then all right, hey, it's time for you to go. That's it, all right? No sweat. <laughs> all right, so let's keep it going. It says, uh, Verse 13, it says, there have no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. So anything that we walk in, right, the most high is with us and it's not more than you can bear. All you have to do is look towards him or the way out. But if you murmur and complaining, right? If you walking after, uh, if you walking in idolatry, if you got any any form of iniquity on your mind, then you won't be able to hear him. When you go through a trial or when you go through tribulation, you're not going to be able to hear his voice because your heart is not set towards him, right? To follow him. Fourteen. It says, "Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judging what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless." Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. And so this is what I want us to understand. If we are all partakers of that blood and the bread and we are all one body, that means that everything or all of us have to walk uh, functionally. We all have to walk uh, um, in righteousness or else you cause the body to be sick or you cause the body to dysfunction and that's when you get cut off. So because we are all partakers, we all have to walk according to the same law, statutes, and commandments. We all have to walk in righteousness before Yah. 1 Corinthians 1.10, right there for you. All right, let's go to uh, Galatians 5 and then I got one more after this and then we're going to wrap it up. We're going to try to close it out. I just want to understand. I want us to understand what this, what this, uh, what this marriage is, because even now we are supposed to be adorning ourselves. We are betrothed uh, to Hamashiach, but even being betrothed to Hamashiach, that means that we are married to him, right? That is, that is the same as being married, in that you cannot go out and play the harlot, that you cannot go out and pursue uh, um, other idols, right? And so I just want us to understand that because the, the, the way we should be adorning ourselves. Um, that has to that has to be constant. Can't just be uh, for the Passover and then okay, the next time I'm gonna examine myself is during Shavuot, Pentecost, right? Or or Tabernacle. No, it has to be every single day, so that when you come into those periods, right, you don't have to. Uh, when you come into those to those points, and you have you have developed this process of of adorning yourself throughout that time. When you come to that point. There might be minor things that you need to get rid of, but as you come into that moed, he can now give an increase. But if you just clean yourself and get dirty again and clean yourself and get dirty again, then you don't. He doesn't take you to another level. He doesn't continue to give you revelation because you're not you haven't learned the basics. Right. You haven't learned the process of, of beautifying yourself. You haven't grasped it yet. So he can't give you an increase. Right. And this is why that's important, because he is calling us to be a standard. He's calling us to be righteous and holy, not just before our brothers and sisters, but to the other nations as well. They have to be able to see Hamashiach in us. Right. Um, Cody, Regina, you have something? No, sorry about that. No, no problem. No problem. All right. What did I say? Galatians. And we all know this one. <clears throat> All right, Galatians 5. And we'll start from we'll start uh from verse uh 16. And so uh for my eye, this is a two-part, right? How do we how do we keep our tabernacle and our altars clean and our altar clean? Um number one, seeing the mistakes of our forefathers, right? Seeing the things that they walked in that uh, required the Most High to judge them, 
uh, because of their unrighteousness and then learning from those things. Those are our examples. And then also looking at the righteousness of our forefathers and learning the things that they did to be pleasing to the Most High and walking those things. And then above all, abstaining from the things that we see listed here. All right. Um, what did I say? 14. Or no, 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 no. What did I say? 16. 16. Uh, Galatians 5, 16. It says, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the spirit is this, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. And so when we talk about keeping our altars clean, that is what that is what it looks like. Abstaining from those things and then walking in what the Most High has called us to walk in. If you walk according to his word, his commandments, that is the foundation. He will build upon that and then he will give you instruction on top of that to further walk in the fruit of the spirit. Right. But that foundation is the fruit of the spirit. That foundation does bring forth love and joy and peace and long suffering. It brings those things forth if you obey that. But there is a increase um, that happens when you continue to walk in those things. So did that answer your question? I know that was a long, a long way around. Yeah, that, they hit it right on the head. I gotta go back and study them scriptures. But yeah, that's a good start right there. Appreciate that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, family. Go ahead, go ahead, Doc. That's on. Okay, good. All right, we're gonna finish it out, family. Revelations 21. Revelations 21. So to sum it up, everything that we just read was the adorning process. Everything that he did in Exodus, he's doing that. When it comes to the blood, when it comes to the deliverance, when it comes to, to showing us his might and uh, uh, freeing us from the things that have us bound, right? Us accepting him as our Elohim, right? Us uh, accepting Hamashiach as our king. All of that is happening right now. And so now we are in that process of beautifying ourselves, right? And so he has given us gifts, right, which we can we can look at those spiritual gifts, which are uh, we can look at them as jewels, right, of silver and gold ornaments and things like that. He has he has given us raiment. He has covered us, right, in, in, in raiment and in fresh raiment. He has cleaned us up. And so now we just have to continue uh, to perfect ourselves. We have to continue that examination process to make sure that when he comes back, that we are ready to be presented. Because at any time we stop the process of looking ourselves over, making sure that everything is good, at any time when we get prideful and puffed up and we just start thinking, oh man, I'm decked out, I look good, then I ain't gotta take another look. If he finds a blemish on you when, you, when he returns, then you have no part in him. And that's what I want us to understand. That this is just a it's an ongoing thing because we're betrothed to him, but it does not guarantee your right end if you don't finish the race. Oh, that's it. Revelation 21. We're gonna start it at verse one, of course. <clears throat> it says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, 
For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne, behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Verse 8, but the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death. When I was looking at that, I thought it was, I found it interesting that he lists these things, but amongst them is unbelievers, right? Because you have uh, certain people who just think that only unbelievers are getting are getting thrown into the lake. Only if you're a non-believer are you going to hell. No, all these other people who walk according to these things could have been believers in him, but they did not serve him. They did not obey him in righteousness. And so they're in, is destruction, right? Although they may have had gifts that were, uh, that we would just call holy, right? Although they did things that we would be like, man, that is so righteous what they're doing. Uh, it's so beautiful how they teach and how they sing and how they do all these things, right? But yet their heart was far from the Most High because they did not seek uh, to keep their altars clear. Within their hearts and within their minds, they still sought to do sin and did walk in sin. And so even though they looked beautiful on the outside, on the inside, they were corrupted. So their end was destruction. This is why you're gonna have many people come before him and say, what, Lord, Lord, I prophesied in your name, right? To go before him and say, I did these things in your name means that what? In your mind, you was like, oh, I should be good if I did these things. This will justify me, right? How good I keep a feast, how good I, I teach, right? How good I pray. All of these things should justify me when I'm standing in front of the judge. But when you stand before him, he's going to say, you didn't walk in any instruction that I require or any instruction that I put forth. And so because of that, you have your portion with the unbelievers. All right? And it all comes back to not looking yourself over, not checking yourself to see if you need to be clean. Uh, you need to be clean. You need to be washed. Right before you come uh, to the Most High, uh, before you come to Amashia. Um, This word presumptuous, we're going to go into that real quick. Because I want us to look at this. All of these people uh, that we see in verse 8, um, they walked presumptuously. All right? If you walk presumptuously, I want us to see in the Torah what the judgment is each and every time. To walk presumptuously is to walk uh, in arrogance, right? It is to do things. It is to rebel, but to rebel with pride, right? It is to it is to rebel, but to do it um, um, without a care in the world. Even if you know who the Most High is and what and what your judgment will be. Uh, an example of that, without going there, was um, uh, the Pharisees uh, when they when they tried to or when they did uh, convince the people to yell, "Crucify the Messiah." Right. And then what did they say? When, when Pilate said, I'm washing my hands, it is. They said, no, let this blood be on us and our children. Right. So even knowing what that entails and knowing for the Pharisees that they are slaying an innocent man, they still didn't care. They wanted him gone that bad. And so people like that, there is a, there is a judgment for them and it's consistent through the text. Let's go to. Um, let's start off with uh, Exodus 21:14. And we're just going to run these real quick and then we're done. Appreciate y'all time.
And we just gonna we just gonna uh, one line these. Just so y'all understand. <clears throat> and do your own research on this word. Examine yourself according to it because it's easy to get caught up in this too. Uh, for, uh, 21, Exodus 21 and 14, it says, but if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile, thou shalt take him from my altar that he may die. That he may die. Let's go to Numbers 15, 30. Um, Matter of fact, we'll start at verse 29. It says, ye shall have one law for him that sinneth through ignorance, both for him that is born among the children of Israel and for the stranger that sojourn, uh, sojourneth in, among, among them. Sorry, 30, it says, but the soul that doeth all presumptuously, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproaches the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people. So obviously for the, for the, uh, for sins like adultery and um, and murder and things like that, then those are presumptuous sins, but the, the penalty for those is death, right? The penalty for um, um, just all out rebellion, no matter what form it is, no matter what act it is, is to be cut off. It is to be cut off, right? And so the reason why I'm bringing this word out is because if the Most High has instructed us to do anything, uh, as we go throughout this year, if he instructs us to do anything, we have to start taking these things dead serious. Remember what we brought out Exodus. He ain't playing. We have to start taking his word seriously because if we don't, if he tells us to walk in something, if he tells us to go and speak a word to someone and we decide not to do it, then we are acting presumptuously. We are uh, uh, walking presumptuously, which is a rebellious sin. It's saying, I know what you have told me to do, and I ain't doing it. And I want us to see the penalty for this, because if you continue to walk in that, when you get to the finish line, you're going to be cut off. And to be cut off, when you get to the finish line, is to get thrown in that lake. Um, let's read 31 too, because that just sums it up. It says, because he had despised the word of the Lord and had broken his commandment, that the soul shall utterly be cut off, his iniquity shall be upon him. And the last one we're going to hit up is uh, Deuteronomy 18. And there's many more in there. <clears throat> if you know you've been walking in this, repent ASAP. All right, Deuteronomy 18 and verse 22. It says, when a prophet speaketh in the same name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord have not spoken, but the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. And then um, when you go over, I believe there's another, another part where it tells you that he is going to be uh, cut off or he is to be uh, put to death. Um, but he says that you should not be afraid of that prophet. Why? Because he's speaking in rebellion. And so if that word comes out to pass, he has no power, right? And the Most High is going to judge that, especially when it comes to his prophets, and when it comes to his teachers, those who are responsible for uh, edifying the shepherd and or edifying the sheep in any way, if you walk presumptuously, then the Most High is, is he going to see you about that. All right, he gonna do it ASAP because you have uh, the impact could be enormous uh, if you are if you are speaking presumptuously and causing people to go astray, right? If you are scattering the sheep, so all of these people, all of these camp leaders and people like that who are doing this and walking in this, it is not gonna end well for them. They think that they're good now because the judgment has not come yet, but it's coming and they are not comprehending that, right? Blind leading the blind. And so uh, just let it not be named among us. Uh, Y'all, man, just stay pure. Keep your altars clean. Examine yourself according to this word. I can't stress it enough. 
Read this word. Get in this word. All right. In line and make sure that you are in line uh, with what the Most High is saying. As you read the word, like I said, he will always give an increase according to what he wants you to do. But you have to learn of him first. Right? You have to learn his heart first. You have to learn what he is pleased with and then do those things. And then you'll see him um, uh, give you more instruction because that trust is being built. Right? So he will he will send you forth. He will he will have you do certain things, have you manifest certain things, because uh, we are all laborers. We are all laborers in this walk. And so nobody's just sitting on the sideline. We all uh, are in this war. And so there are things that he he wants us to do, but we got to be cleansed first. Right. We have, we have to be going through this process. All right. Keep your mind focused on him. Keep your mind pure. Anybody got anything before we close out? Anything at all? All right. Oh, appreciate that, Coach Virginia, putting the, uh, the straws in there. Um, like I said, it is it's, uh, the actual uh, Hebraic picture is like uh, a water boiling over, right? It's the it's the it's the boil up. Um, yeah, so the Most High, he, he's gonna judge that in a worse way. All right. Uh, hallelujah. If nobody has anything, I'll go ahead and pray us out. Um, we are officially in day three of this fast. I don't know if y'all can tell by that lesson, but I'm feeling it. <laughs> I got to hydrate, man. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nobody has anything. Uh, I'll pray us out and then we'll bid each other farewell, fam. Appreciate y'all being on. Uh, I'll be out. We just come before you right now. We just thank you for the word that came forth. We thank you for everyone who spoke on tonight. We just pray that you continue to edify us. Uh, we just ask right now that you examine us. Uh, we will continue to ask for that. Put us in remembrance of the things that you have told us to do. Uh, we just ask that if there is anything within us that is keeping us from you, uh, uh, anything within us that is causing us uh, um, uh, to be disconnected from you, that you would show it to us, that you would bring it to the forefront of our minds. Let us see, uh, let us examine ourselves according to your word and see that thing that you are displeased with and repent for it and walk away from it. We just want to be righteous examples in this earth. We want to be a standard before all those who seek you. We want to be a light uh, um, that people can look towards so that you may be glorified. We don't seek any anything but what you will give us. And we just pray that that remains our mindset and our hearts as we continue to walk uh, uh, and as we continue to approach this Moed, we thank you for passing over us. We thank you for redeeming us. We thank you for that blood that is covering us, but let us go on to perfection. Let us adorn ourselves uh, as a bride adorns herself for her husband. Let us not just uh, look on the gift that you give us. Let us not just, just look on the outside works uh, or the outer cup, but let us look at the inside. Let us look at, at what we are walking in inwardly and if there is anything that we are offering up that is that is defiled if our temples are being desecrated by by jealousy by envy by hatred by anger by frustration insecurities by by any uh uh by any pestilence due to us putting the wrong things in our body if there is anything that is keeping us uh, um from having a clean heart from having a, a, a pure heart, for having a clean uh, a mind, a renewed mind, a mind that is only seeking towards righteousness, a mind that only desires you and your word. And we just ask that you show it to us. We ask that you reveal it unto us. Shed light on those things so that we may purge those things from us. And then we just ask and we pray right now that you show us how to walk in obedience even the more. Let us read your word. Let us do the things that you have, have set forth for us to be established in this walking in. Let us go forward or with the instruction that you will continue to give us through the raw cocoa desk which you have put within all of us. I thank you for this assembly. I thank you for these brothers and sisters. And I just ask you to continue to give them strength. I ask you to continue to watch over each and every last one of us. Keep your hedge of protection around us and our families as uh, we continue to fast, as we continue to pray and meditate on your word. 
uh, and we just pray for Israel. We pray uh, for, for the ones who are lost. We pray for any sheep that have been scattered uh, by false prophets or by wicked pastors. And we just pray that your word reaches them wherever they are. And we pray that when they hear your voice, that they hearken unto it, that they repent and turn back to you. But we know that you are putting your body together. We know that it is coming together and it will be holy and righteous. And so let us do everything that we can to be a part of that body and to stay intact with the body as a Mashiach being our head. And so we just thank you right now. We give you all praise, honor, and glory in the name of Yahshua HaMashiach. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, family. Good Bless word, Hebrew. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. All praises. Um, Y'all stay strong. We got one more day. One more day. All right. Then we're going to die. <laughs> all right. Until then, y'all have a blessed night. And uh, just stay encouraged, family. Yeah, Shalom. 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 Right. Shalom.